Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Today on This Week in Startups, it's Joe Gascoigne from Buffer. Buffer app is crushing it. Thousands of paid members. A very interesting social tool that I am in love with. Stick with us. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Welcome to This Week in Startups. This is our Startup of the Week special. This is our like half-hour program where we find a new startup, a startup that maybe is six months, 12 months, 18 months old, no more than that probably. Somebody new, under 10 people, maybe they've raised their A round, probably more likely they've raised their angel round. And we like to feature what they're doing, what they're building. So it's not going to be like a big three-hour Chris Saka insanity just, hey, tell us what you're building and why, and then maybe we'll get into entrepreneurship a little bit. It's our way of keeping you up to date on cool stuff we find. It could be the top story on a tech meme or launch ticker or TechCrunch or All Things D or Pando Daily. Um, we found it there. Or it could be one of the top startups uh, featured on AngelList, or it could be something that one of my, one of my angel friends uh, told me about or I got pitched on. That's basically what the program is. I got a good one last I had dinner last night with a really good one. Oh, really? Glad I did. Hmm. Really who will good. qualify for this program. Oh, yeah, it's really good. Well, anyway, today we've got a really good one. Jess, J- Joel Gla- Gascoin is with us, and he's from Buffer App, and I'll be introducing him in a minute. But it's a, it's a social tool um, that is allowing you to post to multiple social networks and do all this kind of interesting stuff and buffer your posts so you're not slamming people with a whole bunch. And I was, I was sort of lukewarm on the idea until the product really started advancing. And when I saw it, like, a, I don't know, six months ago, I may have seen it, and I just thought, hmm, not really super appealing, but then as they started adding a lot of support for different networks and the par- product mm. got more robust, I started seeing like, oh, this this actually is starting to turn into something a little more like a, a serious business tool. And so I'll show you how I'm using it and we'll hear from him how it's going as a business. This show, speaking of business, is um, really been conceived of and brought to you by our friends at SendGrid. They are the reason the startup of the week exists, and they are the industry leader. They're a startup themselves in transactional emails. What's transactional email? You know what it is. That's when you get an email saying, hey, you signed up for Buffer. Hey, you signed up for Pandora. Hey, you signed up for Pinterest. Hey, you signed up for Foursquare. Click click here to activate your account. Or, oh, you got some kudos on Foursquare, or your friend checked in here, or your friend added you as a friend. All those important messages that you get on your email that then pull you and seduce you back into using the program, the software, the service that you've built, you spent all this time, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars building software, programs, and services to delight your customers. And then that transactional email comes in. You reset your password. You got a message from somebody. You got a badge. All that important stuff. If you don't get into people's email box right at the top, what happens? If it goes into the spam folder, they don't see it, you lost the customer. All that time building millions of dollars in product development, hundreds of thousands of dollars in product development, out the window. You lost the customer. That's why you need SendGrid. Sending emails sounds like something very simple, right? Yeah, sure. You could hack together a mail server to send some mail probably in a couple of hours. But then, oh, the spam filters. Okay, now it's a couple of more days of development to try to get past the spam filters. Oh, and now they changed their rules. Now it's a couple of weeks. Oh, you got on a blacklist. Now it's a couple of months. Now you got to figure out who's the person you talk to at Google, Yahoo, AOL, all these different mail providers to get off the blacklist. It is basically going to take you down um, as a service. You want to use SendGrid for email delivery that is super simple uh, and works flawlessly. And they are free for 200 emails per day. And their API is smooth like butter on a 90-degree day in Brooklyn. Like, you're just going to cut right through that API, and it's just going to work deliciously and buttery. At the the risk of offending some of my other partners I work with? Yeah. Because when you're building this product, you've got your cloud people, you've got your this. Yeah, you've got a lot of people. It's I like, think SendGrid is the only one I've been working with for two years that hasn't had any... Ins- just set it and forget it. Yeah. Set it and forget one. it. And I'm, that, yeah, and I'm, huge cloud companies go down, but SendGrid hasn't gone down. It's amazing. Yeah. StumbleUpon, Pandora, Pinterest, Foursquare. These... These services live and die by their transactional emails, literally. Can you imagine if on Pinterest you didn't get those messages that people repinned your board? Anyway, you get the idea. Thank you, SendGrid. And if you uh, are using it already and you just want to give them some kudos, say thanks at SendGrid for making uh, This Week in Startups possible. Okay, with me on the program, Joel Gascoigne from Buffer. Welcome to the program, Joel. 
Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me on the program. Uh, it's great to have you on the program, and uh, it's great to be using your product. When did you start Buffer, and why did you start it? Awesome. Yeah, uh, so we started two years ago, uh, pretty much two years to the day. And uh, for me, the, the reason I had the idea for it, the, reason, the inspiration that I had was that uh, I was posting um, tweets you know, on a regular basis. Um, I was posting interesting blog posts I found, um, you know, quotes from uh, people in the space. Uh, for me, it was especially startup-related uh, content. So I would post this, this kind of information on a, on a regular basis um, as I found it. And I found that it was you know, quite a problem if I, I do my reading in batches, and that's what we found is the key use case for, bus, for Buffer, is people like to do their reading in the morning you know, in a half an hour period. And then if they find you know, five or 10 uh, articles that they want to share with their followers or their friends, um, it's, it's a problem if you post all of that at once, you know, five or ten tweets in the space of five minutes. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not good for your followers and it's not good for you either because then you have nothing going out the rest of the day. So, um, so that was the, the initial inspiration and um, we make that super simple by, you know, you add, into your, you, you add this content into your buffer. You don't choose the date and time when you add it in the buffer. You know, we just uh, figure that out for you and we post for you so you can Post to Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Um, you know, on a on a set schedule, every few hours. Um, and we've got lots of integrations as well, so you can you know add from your iPhone on Reader and Pocket, uh, on your iPad. You know, whatever you use to to read this content. It was interesting when we first talked. I don't know when we talked a year ago, six months ago. I was like, hmm, yeah. that's an interesting small feature, but I don't know if I really care about it that much. But then when I really liked about using the product, and here on my screen you can see me. I'm, I, I clicked on the little buffer button here in the corner of my. Um, I'll just zoom in on that. And the, it puts a little thing here with the toolbar on the corner of your Chrome browser, the little stack. Obviously, you're buffering things. Um, so I'm on the launch ticker. I wrote a little something on the um, former Zinger employee who did Cityville, now working at Kixi, who stole all the documents. Did you read about this? Whoa. He took every document, or allegedly, I guess, all these documents, dumped them into his Dropbox, all of his oh. email. And it's like, do you not think that every company monitors network traffic? And if you do something like that, you're going to get busted? Mm -hmm. And it's a serious crime to steal intellectual property you like that? your career. It's, it's career damage. I don't know if it's a death blow, but it's up there. Um, and, and it's a serious, I mean, Kixi is going to have to disavow the person. They'll never be able to hire the person because there's too much liability if the person built something that was any of those ideas. Would be, but anyway, so I hear, I wrote some thoughts on that in the launch ticker. But now I can click on, I want to put that on my Facebook page. I want to put it on my public, Jason, I want to put it on my app.net. I want to put it on my LinkedIn. I want to put it on the launch page. I want to put it on This Week in Startups page. And I want to put it on my public figure I have a page on Facebook for my public finger. I just click all those things. Now, I can either post it now, or I can say add to my buffer. If I say add to my buffer, it goes into my buffer, and then at, what happens now, Joel? Um, so yeah, then it's, one, it's in your buffer, and you know you can set your schedule. We come up with a, a good schedule for everyone, and so it'll just end up at the at the end of your schedule based on the next time in your schedule. So say you've got you know three. Uh, posts already in there for the rest of the day, um, say, you know, at, at uh, 4 p.m. and then 6 p.m. and then 9 p.m., then it'll just end up in the slot that's going to go out at, you know, 11 p.m. And so you can really easily create this schedule of, uh, you know, you can say five, five tweets a day or five Facebook posts a day or whatever you want. So, and it's in the queue and, and we will post it for you. You don't have to worry about that. Hey, why does it keep asking me to reauthorize my Facebook? That was one thing I was wondering. It keeps asking me, like, hey, reauthorize your Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, does it keep doing that over and over? Um, like every day. All right. It's a little um, bug. Yeah, we have a few, we have a few issues, um, like with uh, Facebook and sometimes with Twitter as well. Um, we're sending a lot through those APIs and we, we do come across a few little issues from time to time. Um, you know, if, if something fails, then generally, uh, we we have we have to disconnect and get the user to reauthorize. So you know it can be a problem with a picture they try to post, or it can be um, you know they try to post too frequently. These kind of things. And we're trying to like you know figure out all the different issues and smooth that out. And we got a so lot better over time. Here it shows the tweet. I guess I've been tweeting up a storm. So it's like here's the pending tweet here. Um, some thoughts on the former Zingerville on my Twitter account, but on my LinkedIn account, yeah, it says it's going to do it tomorrow at. 1012. My launch account, it just, I guess it just published it because there wasn't a lot of tweets there already, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
Yeah, exactly. But if I want to send it right now, I change my mind, I can just click and hover over and press this arrow and say, oh, just post it now. Um, exactly. And it will just post it. So do you think people are using this because it's um, the buffering capability, or do you think they're doing it because they just like the cross-posting kind of stuff in the analytics? Yeah, I think yeah, ex exactly. You've, you've you know got the two key benefits we offer right there. I think um, initially it was the, the key thing was the buffering, um, and uh, over time we found that really people really love the cross posting, especially especially with the integrations we have. Um, for example, in Reader, if you you know use Reader on the iPhone um, to read your RSS feeds, uh, there's nothing that they had previous to buffer that you could actually do all this cross-posting. So you'd have to go to Twitter and Facebook uh, separately in their sharing options. Now you can just go in and select all the accounts you want to share to in Buffer. So that, the cross-posting is definitely a, a big one. So now, instead of people putting a Google plus one or a tweet button, I mean, I'm sure they'll put that in as well, somebody like WordPress or um, a Firefox or Pocket Reader, they can add, you can add a... Um, you can add a buffer button there, or they've already added it, I guess, in some cases. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, we're, we're lucky to have, we've got Pocket on board. Um, that's a really good integration we have on iPhone and iPad. And, yeah, we also have the buffer button for web. Um, so we have, uh, you know, 10,000 websites that have the buffer button um, on there, and it's just like the tweet button. Um, so, yeah. So it makes it just easier for them instead of having to worry about building out all the links and stuff like that to just have the buffer button. Exactly. And we found as well with our integrations, for example, Pocket, you know, the, the key use case for Pocket is that uh, people want to be, you know, reading their content in there. So throughout the day, they'll find things that they want to read, but they don't have the time right now. So they put it in their pocket to read it later. And then they might do, you know, half an hour session late in the evening or early in the morning and read through all this content that they found throughout the day. And for Pocket, they really like it because if people use Buffer, they can stay inside Pocket and read more content because uh, previously, you know, if people found you know, lots of articles they wanted to share and they shared them all at once with uh, the Twitter sharing inside Pocket, then they might stop reading uh, you know, more content in Pocket after a little while because uh, they don't want to keep sharing it and flooding their followers. So. And so... Um you got, are you based in the UK or are you just from the UK? No, it's an interesting one. I'm from the UK. We started in the UK, first 10 months we were in the UK. And then uh, we've been, we were out in San Francisco for six months where we went through AngelPad and we closed our seed rounds. That was last year. And then we didn't get visas, so we ended up traveling around, around the world, basically. We spent time in Hong Kong and Tel Aviv and some cool startup scenes there. Now we're back in San Francisco, so I'm speaking to you from San Francisco today, and we're um, here longer term now. And did you get, I mean, this has been a reoccurring theme, especially on the uh, Startup of the Week, where great startups from outside the United States raise money. You got Thomas um, Corte uh, from AngelPad and uh, Dharma Shea and others to put in 400000 to your seed round. You've got money to spend in the United States, and the United States was not giving you a visa, how hard was it to get a proper visa? Exactly, yeah, it was um, definitely a really big challenge for us. Um, part of it is knowing which visas to go for. You know, now we're going for three different visas. We have to figure out all, you know, how to apply for these things, what kind of information we need to provide. Um, we have, we're going through two different immigration lawyers, so it's, it's a pretty complex process. Um, it definitely um, does affect things. Uh, and what's the cost? Um, the cost, I think, you know, in the thousands. Um, uh, it's, it's really more about the time and the hassles. Um, we, oh. like, as you said, we do have, um, we, we raised uh, close to 500k from U.S. investors. We're a U.S. company. We have two U.S. employees as well. So, but you're going. If the United States doesn't act quickly, you could potentially. Um, spend more time overseas and maybe hire people in Hong Kong, maybe hire people in Israel, maybe hire people in the UK or Ireland yeah. or some other country yeah. that treats you with the respect that a founder deserves. Yeah, I definitely think it's a big issue. We spend a lot of time, you know, we spent nine months outside the US kind of waiting on our visas and, the, you know, we could have settled somewhere else. And it, and it also slows down the hiring in a way because we want to have a, a one base and we want to 
have people in the office, we found it. If we're all together, we can move a lot faster. So, and it's a big problem if we hire people who are not in the US, because then we have to get visas, visas for them. So that's why we've hired the last two people, uh, the latest two additions to the team, are from the US, and they work remotely for some time, and then uh, you know, we'll get gather the team all here. So. But you did say you're from the United Kingdom, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Which is the home to most of the terrorists in the world, clearly. I mean, give me a break. I mean, the guy's making social media apps, clearly not a terrorist. I mean, it's just like, what is going on with Obama's administration that they can't solve the stupid issue of, this is like this little tiny sliver of immigration. This is like 0.001% of the immigration problem. And it's one that will solve the jobs problem. If you let brilliant people into the country, they're going to spend money, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars, hiring Americans. If you don't let them into the country, they're going to spend it in another country. What is wrong with you, immigration officer? I, somebody get me on the phone with one. I feel like I should just, during the program, just call the immigration office and harass them. It's unbelievable that Obama cannot get this done. It makes me mental. As I said in previous episodes, there should be an office of ass hattery in Obama's in administration. And when some ass hattery like this is going on, you should be able to call and be like, hey, I've got an example of stupidity in the government. And I should be able to call 1-800-STUPIDITY or go to stupidity.gov. That's it, stupidity.gov. And you should just be able to go and explain the stupidest thing government is doing, and then we should all vote up how stupid it is and how easy the solution would be. You know what? That's not a bad idea. Hold on a second. I got I to gotta, hold on. Everybody wait. This is a message to my super fans. Super fans. Make a website. Stupidity.gov. Or, or so, you can pick the domain name yourself, but it's got to be a good domain name. Super fans. If you hear my voice, I am commanding you. Make a website. Stupidity. Gov. And the way it works is you submit an example of something stupid in government. Then there's a vote button and a post it to your, you use Buffer to post it to all your places. And it automatically emails and harasses and tweets senators. Whenever it hits a, every hundred people who voted up, it tweets to Obama and to the, everybody in government. We just flood them with tweets. So they can't even read their stupid Twitter streams. That's the end of the message. Go build it. See, that's it. And you know what? There's a crazy super fan out there who's going to build this right now for me. I don't doubt it. Just build it. Somebody build it. Stupidity.gov. Starbucks has a really interesting crowdsourced way to get new ideas and express. This isn't about new ideas. Grievance. This is about no, shaming our government officials. But to express what is needed. In no. A, in a crowd this is model. about shaming the stupidity of our government and how inefficient and dumb they are. All right, let's get back to Joel. <laughs> so, Joel, um, how on earth did you get the attention? Because we just had this happen on an Ask Jason recently. Somebody was from another country and they were complaining. And they kind of had, I want to say complaining, but there was a little bit of a whiny tinge to it. Like, how do I get the attention of the, the U.S. investors? How do I get my company taken seriously? I'm from Europe. Nobody takes European startups seriously. You were able to do it. How? Um, so I think the key thing we had going for us was our traction. So um, we reached realm and profitability. You had enough for me and my co-founder, Leo, to get by. And that's the point when we jumped on a plane, came to San Francisco, and got chatting to people. And then that's when we discovered AngelPad and we applied. And I think it was definitely our traction that was very attractive to them. What was the traction exactly? You had 1,000 paying members, 500 paying members. They were paying $10 a month, $10 a year. What was it specifically in the traction that Thomas, a very astute individual at AngelPad, great program, found so appealing about Buffer? Yeah, at the time that we applied, we had uh, 25,000 users overall and uh, paying customers. We were making about 4K a month uh, US revenue at that point, um, but we were also growing 10% week over week. Uh, so that was definitely the key thing. 
Ah, and now where is it? Um, so now we have uh, uh, 350,000 users overall. Um, we still have a good conversion, about 1.6, 1.7% pay. So we have close to 6,000 users right now. And the paid plan is $10 a month. So it's just a simple freemium model. You're making almost a million dollars a year. Yeah, we're close to a million dollar run rate now. And you've got five employees. Uh, we're seven now. So you break uh, yeah. you break even even with all this you're basically breaking yeah. even. Yeah, yeah, we we break even and um, we have most of the funding still in the bank, uh, but we're expanding the team pretty quick now. Yeah. Now that we're back in San Francisco. Uh, let's face it, um, the app is elegantly simple, which means easy to copy. And in fact, you're not the first person to make software like this. You're probably the tenth or twentieth. Why is it that you feel you're succeeding so well when those other apps, I would say, meandered? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. There's definitely been, this has been done a few times. Um, there was uh, other startups that came out a bit at the same time as us. I think one of the key ones is um, that we had a strong content marketing approach. That was really, really key. So we What does that mean, content so marketing? We, we, so we did, uh, we did blogging ourselves and we did guest posting for other people. And then so we built a very good relationship with uh, bloggers, with the press. Um, we managed to have a very consistent schedule of um, being in other blogs with, with the product and being in press very, very regularly. And then it was just yeah, kind of a key focus on that side and then building out the product as fast as we could. And I think one of the key things we have now that differentiates us is this approach with the integrations. So the key thing I see is that um, for us to help people share more effectively, we need to be where they read that content. So there's a lot of other tools out there that try and get the users to come into their products all the time. So you know, you see something and then you have to bring that article in and, and share it. And it's not very convenient. So that's why we're really working hard on these integrations to be in, you know, wherever you read that content, uh, we'll be there so you can just share it as well. But if I hit the buffer button, I have to log into buffer. So, you know, as opposed to say the Facebook or the the, the um, Twitter button where I'm probably going to be logged in already. So if you add it, you have to add it. It's not replacing the Facebook or the Twitter button right now. Yeah, that's true. Um, though luckily with the integrations, we've made it super seamless. So you can actually sign in with Twitter or Facebook to, to sign up to Buffer and there's no, there's no other steps. Um, and so what's the future of the business, do you think? I mean, what's the, what's the size that this business can become? Because let's face it again, there's basically two features here, the, I think the analytics and uh, the buffering, and maybe the cross-posting, I guess, but there's a lot of cross-posting after that. So you're, you've got a small set of features here. Does that mean there's a small audience and that you have to really ramp up and add other features quickly? I mean, do you ultimately become like Radiant 6 or um, you know, like an industrial strength social app like Hootsuite or Radiant 6, or are you going to be more on the sort of lightweight individual user side? What, what do you think is the future of Buffer app? That's a really good question. I think um, our, our key focus is to like, kind of become ubiquitous in the medium term. So really that's the integration is what we're completely focused on. Um, we're seeing all kinds of different users. So we're seeing consumer users, um, individuals. We're seeing people with small businesses, and we're seeing people in between that where they, you know, they might be a photographer or something. They've got their thing, anything they're trying to promote. And this is uh, growing very, very fast. And then we also have um, much bigger companies. We have uh, Mailchimp users regularly, Readwrite Web users, uh, Wired Business are using us. So we have like the full range. And I think. Um, keeping it simple, well, I, I, I believe that can work in the longer term um, to just become uh, very widespread. And I think we can keep growing in this way um, just with a very simple paid offering. Maybe further down the line, I, I think there's um, interesting options open up when we, you know, when we get into the millions of users and, um, we, and maybe then at that point we can think about adding more on the business side. Um, there's many different directions we could go at that point. But right now, um, you know, we're close to a million dollar run rate just based on 350,000 users. So we're lucky because we can get to the millions of users and still, you know, with a kind of low number of users for a product that is kind of in the social space, we can have very strong revenues. Well, listen, I, you know, I, was, uh, I wasn't super impressed with the product when I first saw it, 
but you were very consistent and sort of keep me up to date on the progress. And I really think that you're a great entrepreneur and a great emerging entrepreneur because you've been very persistent in uh, pursuing this idea and keeping people up to date on it. I think there's some real lessons here as to what Joel did in terms of staying in touch with people and showing demonstrative growth in the program. Every couple of months, you'd email me or tweet me, hey, here's where we're at. We're get, making progress. And it, you must have read Mark Suster, the host of This Week in Venture Capital's post on connecting dots, correct? Yeah, yeah, connecting backwards, right? Yeah, and so people look backwards, and I look at Joel, and I'm like, Kieran was like, well, I weren't you kind of dismissive of like Joel's idea? Because I was like, you got to get this guy on the program. This is great. So weren't you dismissive of the idea when it started? I was like, well, I, I hope I wasn't dismissive, but I think I did tell you, frankly, like, I think this is just like one feature. What's the big picture here? Yeah, yeah. I think, I mean, we're seeing that a lot. Is you know, Now we're seeing some really interesting entrepreneurs uh, signing up the buffer. We, we have a way to see, you know, someone influential like yourself. You, you pop up on our, on our radar and so we're seeing people that uh, didn't necessarily, necessarily see the value before. But like you say, we're, we're adding these integrations fast, and we're really uh, making it much more solid now. So I think it it makes sense. I think your decision back then you know, made, made a lot of sense. But we just keep pushing, like you say, and uh, very regularly we try and be on everyone's radar, keep everyone up to date. And uh, I think sooner or later, like that's our thinking is that Sooner or later, everyone will gradually kind of figure out that it can be very useful for them. Yeah. Well, listen, continue to success. you have any questions, Tyler, or anything? No. Nope. Any insights? You use Buffer? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. You will after this. Here, my, I do have a question. You do? Okay. And it's a, it's a ball buster question for you. But well, we expect uh, nothing less. Aff affectionately. Um, who was it? I think it w was it Sokka, perhaps, on who was kind of down on clout, right? He's always been taking the position that he didn't want to be in clout, he didn't like the idea of scoring people, right. but it's he because feels everybody should be equal. So I think but the, while he respects right. but at, what at, they've accomplished, he doesn't agree exactly with this methodology of having the number out there, but I think it's also a little bit of protectionist. But there was also it's just a, a stylistic yes. thing he doesn't like, but he's learned to appreciate it. Sure, but there's an element of it that he doesn't like, which is it affects how people use the service. Twitter. Right. That's exactly what I said. Yeah, could you, could, now people are putting out quotes right. that they hope will be retweeted or replied to. Like, so if I ask, what are you going at for Halloween, or what did you think of the debate, I get hundreds of people who reply to me, mm -hmm. and I get an extra point of clout. Mm -hmm. But I really actually didn't want to ask that question. I'm asking it to optimize my clout. Right. And you might not say things that you normally would, and whatever. You become inorganic in how you use it. Right. So my, that is my question is... How have you got any hint from the social networks about how they feel about the service? About Buffer? Yeah. None. None. I mean, it, it, it's just the cross posting and stuff like that. And I think people, not, I mean, I've gotten a lot of complaints. I played 20 questions as to what would be my mm -hmm. Halloween outfit mm -hmm. the other week. And people got really upset. Like, somebody's like, now I'm going to unsubscribe from you because you flooded my feed. And I was like, ban. You know, like, I really mm -hmm. don't want somebody who's going to be nonsense. It was a fun game of 20 questions. And you're not following enough people that my, you know, 15 responses flooded your Twitter account. But, you know, like flooded, who cares, you know. So mm. I don't think, I think this sort of helps. Because as Joel was saying, if you're reading the news in the morning, like I'm reading the ticker. I, when it happens, I do it bursty. I go to the ticker I, in between shows, in between meetings. I write 10 comments. And then I want to tweet three or four of those. But I don't want to do them back to back. I want people to have time to read it and then come back to my Twitter feed or whatever. So I just buffer them now. And then every two hours they go out. Hmm. It works so much better. People don't see four in a row. It is actually a good feature, and I, I didn't appreciate it until I started using it. Listen, Joel, continued success. Everybody who is interested, go to bufferapp.com. It's a really great program. I've been using it myself. And everybody check out uh, at SendGrid. Thank at SendGrid for making this possible. And, uh, Joel, let's get a cup of coffee next time I'm in San Francisco, okay? Absolutely. Thanks, Jason. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Uh, well done. Well done, Buffer. And a really great entrepreneur there, emerging entrepreneur, Joel Gascoin. And um, he is Joel Gascoin, but coin is not C-O-I-N. It's C-O-I-G-N-E on uh, Twitter. Go check out Buffer app. I really enjoy it. And Tyler, thank you uh, for joining me. And we'll see you all next time on This Week in Startups.